Alright, welcome back to our Eliza Let's Analyze. We're going to finish off Chapter 2, The Night Club. We're coming in off of the dinner scene. At the end of the dinner scene, Soren told us that this nightclub was SM themed. This is an unusual writing situation. Normally you tell the player to expect something, and they get excited for it, and then you show them that something. Like, the dark forests of Shrigglebloch are full of spiders. And then the player's like, yeah, I gotta go into a dark forest and fight some spiders. Yeah. It's really rare to just have that fizzle out. There are times when it gets subverted, but just dropping it, that's kind of a strange move. Hmm. So, uh, this is a little weird. Why did they say it was an S&M club if it's not? It's not even like a subversion, it just... just isn't. What's that about? I thought you said this was like some S&M club. Oh, well, uh... They might have taken all of that stuff down since the last I was here. So the point here is, and I, I'm pretty sure about this, but I can't read the writer's mind. The point here is that the writer probably isn't interested in moving the story forward with a heavy pace. They're not interested in making sure that you are riveted by the pace of the story. Instead, they want to make absolutely sure that you don't buy into Soren's dream machine. If you start to think, oh my gosh, Evelyn, you have got to get over whatever is bothering you because this dream machine is going to change the world. If you get into that sort of headspace, that's going to ruin the game. So they have to make sure that Soren comes off as a pervert and a flake. Are you sure you're remembering this place correctly? Actually, would you excuse me for a moment? I want to talk to those people over there. Soren points to a group of women. Are those people you know? Not currently, but hopefully I can change that. Wait, Soren, I don't know anybody here. He's already gone. And now we know that Soren is a flake. This is really important because now we won't buy his story of a magical dream machine. And we can get back on track with Evelyn as the star of the story instead of the incredible dream machine as the star of the story. Maybe that wasn't the point, but that's the point that I took away from it. Don't trust Soren. Don't trust his magical dream machine stories. Why is he like this? Abandoned the second I walked in. Okay. Now I have to sit here by myself, acting like I'm cool enough to be here on my own. Like Maya. Great. So we are in the meaty section of the game. We just got to hear all of Soren's major plot elements. We're about to hear Nora introduce herself for real. And tomorrow we're gonna meet Rainer and hear his uh, intro. So we're done, with the, we're done with the part of the game where we're getting used to Evelyn. Now we're into the part of the game where we're getting used to the world. And we're getting this enormous plot dump. Every one of these scenes is drenched in stuff we should feel about these characters. It doesn't feel like a ton of exposition though because we're not getting a lot of, like, plot plot, we're getting a lot of character beats. And it's so fun and easy, especially in a VN environment, to get those character beats. They feel a lot more effortless than a plot would. Nora almost runs to the table when she sees me. Evelyn! Hey, Evelyn, get to the chopper. No. Thank goodness, I've been rescued. Oh, I'm so happy you came! Yeah, I wanted to support you. Soren came too, but he ditched me to chat up some people. He said he thought this was like an S&M club or something. What? No, it's not like that at all. Where did he get that idea? Another reason they may have wanted to put us in the S&M club mood. Um, there are a lot of undercurrents that Nora is probably a lesbian who's attracted to us. It doesn't ever come to anything in this story. It's, uh, it's not really a romance story, but... Um, I guess they want to make sure that you know that there there is something to that. I don't know. Maybe he just hoped it was. Ah, who cares? I wasn't interested in seeing Soren. I wanted to see you! Now I'm choosing all of the happy options. You can choose the bad options. Bad, quote-unquote. You can choose the, the shy options or the down options if you'd like. It doesn't change the story. It just changes what you think of the story. I wanted to see you too. I have a little bit of setup left to do. Do you want to come help? Okay, but you'll have to tell me what to do. No, it's simple. I'll show you. Nora leads me to the stage area. There are multiple pieces of equipment connected by huge tangles of thick wires. Here is where 
a very basic writing technique is being used extremely well. In order to make a character likable, all you have to do is make the character like something, and like it openly and publicly. If someone is willing to tell you what they like, that's kind of a vulnerable thing. It's showing that they trust you, and that they appreciate you, and they're opening up to you. It doesn't even matter whether the main character opens up back or ends up connecting with them. The very fact that the other character is being open and happy and friendly and trusting is enough to make them likable. But the one thing that makes this difficult is that it's actually quite a challenge to write a character being open and happy about something in a way that is fun, in a way that is interesting. If you try and force it, it'll feel really forced. So the basic technique here is make sure that the character likes something that you, as a writer, like. I couldn't write someone who is excited about sports very convincingly because I am not a sports guy. In this case, the writer is also an electronic musician, and it's very clear he loves his electronic music, and he's passed it on to Nora, and it makes he means that he can write some fairly effortless Nora liking something scenes, because he's talking from the heart. Looking at the setup, I realize I know nothing. Are these modulars? Some of them. The one over there with all the cables coming out of it? That one is a modular. They all have cables coming out of them. This one? <laughs> no, the one with the little colored cables on the front. Oh, okay. I'm still not sure which piece of gear she's talking about. The others are not modular. They're just regular synthesizers. Okay, are you... Is this like, is each one of these going to make a different sound? <laughs> Where should we start? Nora points towards a small plastic keyboard. This is an SH-101. It's really hot. I love the sound. It's useful for piercing leads. You know, noises like that. I use it quite a lot. Piercing leads. Okay. Nora points to another larger synthesizer. This one is black with brown wood paneling on the sides and silver dials on the front, and even I know what this one is. This is a Moog. You've heard of a Moog, right? I've heard the name, maybe. It's not Moog? I guess I never heard anyone say it aloud. Nope. Moog. Moog. Not Moog. So I honestly think that the last five or so lines are genius. And it's really, really fun to say that because it's just really dumb stuff, right? It's like, oh, Moog, not Moog? I guess I've never heard of anyone say it aloud. Even though that sounds really, really basic as an exchange, there are two shining things about it. The first is this line here. It's very clear that this was written with voice actors in mind. And it's really rare to see a writer who can use a voice actor in their writing because the writing happens first. And so it's a great joy to see something so blatant like this, where it's just total joyous nonsense in text form. The other thing is, uh, by having uh, Evelyn come back with something like, I've never heard anybody say it aloud, and stuff like that, it's just a tiny bit of opening up. It allows us to engage with Nora much more um, evenly, much more happily, but it doesn't actually... Um, move Evelyn into like a oh I love Nora sort of thing. It's just a very gentle connection and it allows the whole sequence to flow just so much more naturally because we are showing a little bit of involvement. It's not just all Nora going on and on and on and on and on while we stand there and stare at her blankly. Okay. Um, I'm not sure I can handle this all at once. Nora doesn't hear me. Instead she holds up a small silver and white box. Surely you know about this one. It's a Roland TB-303. You know, the acid house sounds. <laughs> acid house. It's just as well. This is not an ordinary model, of course. Nora points at some words on the front panel. Devilfish. The Devilfish 303 is a modified, upgraded version of the original. A guy in Australia does it? Oh, they're really awesome. So you can see... This sort of writing is tough to pull off unless you are also actually interested in this kind of thing. Evelyn, why don't I teach you some of these things? It might do you some good to learn something new. You could come over sometime and we can make some noise together. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a fun time. Nora plugs in more cables, creating a spaghetti-like arrangement that stretches across the entire table. All right, that should do it. Thanks for your help. Yeah, we were a big help. 
No problem. Time for me to shake this place into the ground. So I'm going to go ahead and turn the audio back up. Um, the the music is really loud in this sec in this section, but it's important to note that it's not actually a song. What we're hearing is not intended to be what Evelyn is hearing. We're hearing Evelyn's impression of the music. Like, we're going to hear it as if the music is behind a wall. That's important for a couple of reasons. First, although this guy is a musician, the writer is a musician, writing music on behalf of a character is a really challenging proposition. So I can see why he wouldn't have wanted to actually write like a, a full featured song on behalf of Nora in character as Nora, um, because it might not have connected correctly. The other thing is that hearing it as an impression lets us know how Evelyn is feeling from an audio perspective. Um, and that's a really neat trick. It lets us really get into the idea that Evelyn is being blown away by the music. Reason I'm saying this now is because you probably won't be able to hear me. Oh, I forgot. Soren comes back first. <laughs> ah, time for the main event. Funny to see Nora like this, isn't it? Oh, she's come a long way from the timid junior programmer I remember. Interesting stage name, too. Little Sappho. Y you know what Sappho indicates, don't you? Yes, I know. Don't patronize me, please. Oh, okay, of course you know. That was a silly question. I apologize. This is something that makes Soren a little bit more approachable than your average flaky asshole. He does keep backing off whenever he oversteps. That's not something I've ever seen a tech bro do, but it does make Soren uh, a nicer character, someone that we don't have to hate. Nora comes back. People are cheering already. Nora presses some buttons. Did you know Nora was capable of creating work like this? I think she was always this way. You just didn't see it. I thought she was wonderful before, but, but now... So, it's still really loud. <laughs> um, so, that was, uh, that had two important things to it. First is, we now know more about Nora, what she's capable of, what she likes. We're connected to her just a little bit better. Um, and we like her. She's a very likable person, and that's come through pretty well. We also know a little bit more about Evelyn and how she responds to things, how she feels things. There's nothing surprising about how she feels about this concert. There's no, like, particularly amazing connection that we made or anything like that. It's just some fairly normal responses to loud music. But it's something that Evelyn is allowed to feel without having to open up. 
So she doesn't have to talk about her depression or her dark history or her confusion about deep philosophical things. She can talk about how much she likes this music or how much it pounds through her. And we can tell that she has emotions, that she has feelings, that she can do this sort of connecting, even if it's not connecting to any of the problems inside of her or to the outside world, she can at least connect to music. So this is an important step out of her shell for her, and this is why it ends the second chapter. It's fine. I don't always need to understand what I'm hearing or seeing, although I do make very long videos about them. Too big, too loud to interpret. Soren disappeared at some point. Who cares? Everything is churning, sloshing, and washing. A wave breaking on a rocky shore and dashed into the mist. And this is Evelyn's apartment. I'm not sure how I got here, and I'm not sure whether or not chapter two has ended yet. We'll keep pushing on just a little bit more. Good that I'm here though, right? Here in bed. Okay, wait, I remember now, I took a car. Everything's fine. I guess I did it then. I went out and I did a thing. That was fun, I think. It was nice to see Nora. I don't think my body is very happy with me right now though. Ugh. I think I'll just close my eyes and rest for another second before I get ready for bed properly. Hmm. Chapter 3. Alright, well we're going to leave Chapter 3 for another time. Because uh, this is more than enough for one episode. I don't plan to let another two weeks go by before I post the next episode, but who knows? We'll get to the end eventually. Thank you for your time.